The answer to life, the universe, and everything. Microphone. Despite this time of the day, might sound lunch, the great answer. I'm going to try to convince you today that Silid is quite a good answer as well. In particular, after four years of PhD, Silid's biodiversity can be quite a good answer. So uh, my talk today will be just split in three main parts. A very brief introduction, because if you have spent here the morning, you probably know a lot of Silid's especially a lot of negative aspects on a lot of pests. And uh, we will just move to the New Zealand psyllids, so their biodiversity, their distribution, and, um, well, their beauty, if you ask me. And uh, we will end up with the insect, bacteria, and uh, plants relationship, which was uh, sort of the second half of my PhD. So after assessing the biodiversity of psyllids, try to understand how these uh, interact with, between each other and uh, with their host plants and how their bacteria as well interact both with plants, psyllids, and with other bacteria. So, um, well, uh, this was the result of four years of PhD, or as I like to call it, um, what it takes to move from here to here. <laughs> four years, people, that's, yeah, bad stuff. So why PhD, uh, why, why, why psyllids are very, very cool? Um, well, we have seen that uh, a single invasion uh, can cause a lot of damages. So I'm not going to repeat again, but TPP in New Zealand, vectoring, Liberibacter, caused the zebra chip disease. And one of the most recent studies from uh, Grant and Jessica has stated that millions of dollars per year are, uh, uh, well, not wasted, but spent trying to stop this. Um, now, this is obviously the top of the pyramid, the tip of the iceberg, because we have a disease and we are trying to understand uh, how, to, uh, how to fight the disease, how to protect the plants. But obviously, while we have our uh, biosecurity risk and our epidemiology, we can't really uh, get enough information, we can't really fight anything if we don't have the right tools. And we get the right tools when we start uh, understanding, as Jackie uh, does, for example, that there are a number of bacteria. Uh, some even belonging to the same genus, like Liberibacter, can uh, sort of create false positives, which for us is a big problem. And you understand this only when you start looking into the bacteria. And what I started looking into it is actually the base of the pyramid. So, if we have multiple um, species of bacteria belonging even to the same genus, can we have the same issue just caused by uh, a lot of different native endemic psyllids that nobody really cares much about until an adventive psyllid, an exotic psyllid, vector is something more dangerous is taking part in the play. Um, so yeah, it appears quite obvious looking at the pyramid that you can't do anything if you don't start from the base. So what I did was start working on the New Zealand psyllids. The New Zealand psyllids are um, quite a good fauna to start with because they are not as many as the Australian ones, but still they include uh, six out of the eight families worldwide. They include now some of the pests. Uh, they include some introduced psyllids that have been introduced as biocontrol agents. So again, it's quite a, a nice split to look at worldwide psyllids without having to deal with 4,000 and plus species. We are talking about um, our days of field collections, uh, quite often in the rain, in the mud, uh, and yeah, it was really terrible. I have really told me this was uh, an awful period for me, and whoever has had uh, some field collection, yeah, I really feel for you. Uh, yeah, so no, for me it was not at all. Uh, it was really, truly amazing going around New Zealand. Now, uh, I'm not just bragging about that. I wanted to show you how very different areas of New Zealand could be, um, uh, inspected, and uh, I could collect psyllids from. And we're talking literally, you can find psyllids everywhere. Um, close to lakes, close to the sea, on the beach. You can find uh, psyllids up to uh, higher than 2,000 meters on the sea level. So on alpine, subalpines, you can find it in the forest. There is a lot to discover. And uh, what obviously surprised me was there is a lot more than what we were expecting. I could collect from uh, more than 500 locations only in New Zealand and up to 100 on the southeastern coast of Australia, so from um, Adelaide up to Port Douglas. 
Now, um, I had to start with a sort of um, recap of what was known back then. So the paper came out in 2016, but I started working on it in 2014, trying to understand so how many species were known to be in New Zealand, uh, how many species were known to be there but were not described, how many species arrived since the previous biggest um, analysis that was uh, conducted in 1985, so 30 years, uh, how much 30 years of not really looking much at psyllids, uh, could, could, what, what, what this could have caused, how many new psyllids from where. Um, the total of the, uh, from the article was about 100 species. What I could find after my analysis is more or less 120 taxa, uh, of which 21 new species. Uh, never described, never reported to be in New Zealand. Uh, only one of these 21 is introduced. I'm saying introduced because it's uh, very possibly from Australia, based on the association of, with a non-native to New Zealand host plant. The other 20 are all endemic taxa, and uh, they are quite, um, quite cryptic, morphologically very, very similar, quite often associated with a previously known host plant that is hosting other species of described psyllids. Um, problem was obviously that so far, at least in New Zealand, uh, identification was based on the literature, on the taxonomy, and on the morphology. Uh, again, this obviously highlights the problem. If the morphology, morphology is cryptically similar, then you, ver you struggle very much identifying them. If in addition to this, um, you know that there is a psyllid, let's say, on the fuchsia plant, you won't probably spend too much time trying to understand if that exact species is the same throughout all New Zealand. Uh, for this, molecular analysis helped a lot. Uh, in particular, <clears throat> basic CO1 barcoding highlighted the presence of a lot of variation, a lot more than what I could expect. Um, I went back then on uh, morphology, tried to confirm if this data was a, a, a true discovery or if it was some sort of false positive. We have heard today that you, uh, CO1 obviously is mitochondrial, so we can have a lot of issues with that. Uh, pseudogenes, just to say something. Um, a very interesting approach that is coming up in this latest year is trying to use cytochrome oxidase in a sort of an integrative taxonomy approach. Uh, so connecting not only DNA, but morphology, and what I used was mostly host plant association because psyllids have a very strong relationship with their host plant. Um, now, and this table is quite interesting because um, there's a very weird name you can see up there. While on the right there is a cytochrome oxidase, uh, so the, the usual 3% threshold, which is quite often used and quite well used and uh, supported for psyllids. Um, all the others are methods that are just using cytochrome oxidase um, to determine how many taxa are there. Um, some of these are uh, working only with a previously prepared uh, ultrametric tree, uh, such as PTP uh, and MPTP, while, for example, ABGD is uh, just using the, um, the fastest sequences. Now, you can see the numbers. So, based on different methods, the same group of psyllids, this is a group of psyllids from uh, Manuka and Kanuka, from which only uh, two species were described. So even the most uh, strict method is highlighting the presence of four species, but then the average is between 12 and 14. Um, it, it was quite interesting. This will be published in a very short amount of time. It's under review now, so probably in a few weeks you will be able to see it. Um, I found it extremely interesting. So this is, again, a, a confirmation that uh, using only um, DNA can be a lot tricky, even supporting your results with some of these methods. If you use just a single one of them, you can be very biased towards one end or the other. Um, at least for psyllids, I would always suggest to apply also morphological analysis and uh, try to be yeah, very sure if uh, what DNA says is actually confirmed. Um, I then used my um, species delimitation on the New Zealand psyllids to try to understand something more about the um, distinction of the bacteria and the plants' communities. Um, next generation sequencing, as it was described earlier, uh, since one of the first analyses I could run, what you can 
immediately see here, just with your eyes, uh, every color is a, a different group of bacteria, and every line is an insect. And what appears immediately is that you can notice some pattern. So some of these insects have a similar pattern of in, in the bacterial composition. Now, this was exactly what I did when I opened and started doing my analysis. Well, I could see something. I wanted to see, say, yeah, let, let's try to validate this. And um, I did this series of analysis. So alpha diversity test is just a simple test that tells you what's the diversity. We had more than 600 taxa of bacteria. And uh, you can come out saying, well, there is a lot of diversity, but maybe each and every species of psyllid has the same diversity within. Uh, that was not true. Thanks to beta diversity test, we could say that different insects have clearly different bacterial communities. Then what is this based on? So what makes the bacterial community different? Um, starting thinking about it, we came up with some ecological factors. Could be geography, could be host plant association, and of course could be different species have different bacterial communities because are different species. Uh, the Donis approach tells you that different insect species have different bacterial communities because they are different species. Now, again, the problem was still that different psyllid species are associated with different host plants. So the fact that you find different community, it still can be linked to the plant more than to the taxonomy of the insect. But mantle tests and partial mantle tests confirm that actually an astonishing almost 40% of the diversity, the composition of the microbial community in each psyllid can be accounted just because of the taxonomy of the insect. So again, I know the title was not too humble, but probably understanding a bit more about the psyllid diversity and the psyllid taxonomy, it's really the answer to understanding a bit more on the relationship that this bacteria vectored by the psyllids can have on a future plant pathogen, adventive species of psyllids vectoring plant pathogens, and it can surely give us a, a tool to fight this. Um, and yeah, as I stated here, this will provide for sure a library to compare your identification of psyllids to, and uh, will provide for sure as well um, um, some sort of uh, uh, improved method for the identification or the risk of transmission of plant pathogen. And yeah, so they can be the good answer to life, the universe, and everything else. At least they were for the last four, four years for me. So thank you very much. And that's it. I was sure 42 was going to come up somewhere. I'm sort of feeling vaguely disappointed. Are there any questions for Francesco? David? Thank you, Francesca. That's really fascinating. So if I've, if I've got that right, what you're postulating is basically a, a co-evolutionary system between psyllids and the bacteria that are inside them. And then the question that I would like to ask is, is that maintained even when different psyllid species feed on the same species of plant? Thank you very much for the question. So um, what I was referring here is the overall composition of the uh, microbial community, which again, for each species can count up to 100, 200, 300 different types of bacteria. Now, I also uh, narrowed down this trying to understand, for example, if the primary symbiont or uh, some of the secondary symbionts are uh, more involved in giving us this result that tells it's linked. So it's quite interesting because uh, a lot of the results comes out exactly from the fact that I was lucky enough to collect different species from the same individual host plant. So uh, once you are able to do that, you can immediately this, so, and, you have two species with different microbial communities on the same individual host plant, which means uh, it's any difference in the microbial community is not from the geography, is not from the host plant, because again, same individual plant, must be from something else. So when starting to compare, 
primary symbiont, which is vertically transmitted, so we expect it to be different. It is surely co-evolved with the insect. But already the phylogeny of the secondary symbionts doesn't appear to be as well defined as the primary one. So as again in the literature is already stated, it's very possible that uh, secondary symbionts are both vertically and horizontally transmitted. And that's why emphasize the phylogeny. But still, living on the same plant in the same exot plant is, doesn't bring the two insects to have the same um, microbial community. So yeah, it, it, it is retained. 